friends, please subscribe to my channels, which are found in the description of this video. Karen Matthews. It's a name I'll try to forget for the rest of my life. I'm Roger Turner, and I've been married to Karen for 20 years. Like most ignorant husbands, I thought our marriage was good until I discovered the opposite. Karen and I are two working, class children from a municipal area. We went to the same school, although we had different groups of friends. We knew each other, but we didn't start dating until a few years after we graduated from high school. At that time, Karen was working as a lawyer's secretary, and I had just started my own business. My business was websites, in particular, design and hosting. Two comparison sites that I developed made a lot of profit, one for insurance, the other for price comparison. When Karen and I got married, I was already worth a lot of money, and to protect my business, my lawyer offered to sign a prenuptial agreement. It said that if the marriage broke up for any reason, Karen would receive a percentage of my personal fortune, and thinking that we would be together all our lives, I was happy to sign it. Karen signed it knowing that no matter what happened, she would be rich. Although our careers were different, we were good at one thing, in bed. 19 months after the wedding, our eldest son was born, and four years later, the twins. Now I was the father of three boys. The only thing we disagreed about were the names, and for some reason Karen wanted to use names with a biblical background. Since we weren't religious, I didn't see the point. We agreed on the name Robert for the eldest child, and four years later the twins were named Ethan and Luke. Even though we both worked, we always found time on weekends to spend them together as a family. We have a nice family home in a nice neighborhood. Most of our neighbors are businessmen and a few minor celebrities. We are constantly invited to parties or business events, but we often refused invitations to spend time with the children. My business had grown to the point where I now had 40 employees. The director of production and the second person after me was Don Healy. The rest of the staff are either technical specialists or financial workers. As any employer knows, good employees are hard to find these days and even harder to keep. For this reason, I have always been looking for incentive measures to retain my employees. Every year on their birthday, I gave them a day off with pay, plus I paid for lunch for an employee and his spouse or partner. I decided to offer all employees a package of private medical care, the advantage of which was that they could receive urgent treatment rather than queue up at the NHS. Since the package included the next of kin, most of the staff appreciated this gesture. Part of the medical package was a health check every two years. I was a month away from my 45th birthday when I received an invitation to a medical examination. Thinking that this would set a good example for my employees, I agreed. The doctor asked me a few questions about my lifestyle. Do I smoke? Do I drink? The usual questions that one would expect. He carried out all the usual checks, such as measuring height, weight, and blood pressure. To complete the tests, I was asked to take a blood and urine test. The doctor explained that they would conduct tests, and if there were any problems, they would contact me. I went back to work knowing that I looked healthy and fit. In the evening, Karen and I talked about Robert's upcoming 18th birthday. We decided to throw a party for him, and after some thought, we agreed on the venue. We both said we didn't want drunk 18-year-olds walking around our house. Two days before the party, I received the news that turned my life around. The doctor wanted to talk to me about the results of my tests. Bad news, doc? I asked, sitting down where the doctor pointed. It's not life-threatening, Mr. Turner. The problem is that you seem to have hemochromatosis. Since you lead a relatively healthy lifestyle, you don't have any obvious symptoms. With the help of some medications, we can help control the disease. Do you have any idea how I could get infected? I asked. I'm afraid it's a hereditary condition, Mr. Turner. In each known case, the symptoms are different. Some men suffer from chronic internal pain, others live without pain, but are infertile. You belong to the latter group. Hereditary. Then I'd better check on my sons. Doc, did you just say that I'm infertile? Yes, Mr. Turner. The test results show that you are sterile, and based on our experience, I would say that you have always been sterile. I could tell by the look on his face what he was thinking. The doctor told me about the medications he prescribed. Fortunately, he gave me some flyers to read, but being shocked, I didn't hear too much of what he told me. I planned to return to the office before the end of the day, but instead went home. While Karen was at work and the boys were at school, I had time to think. 
Having stopped feeling sorry for myself, I ordered urgent tests for the boys. If these are not my sons, I want answers from my wife. During dinner that night, I told them what I had learned today, and the boys didn't mind being tested. Karen wasn't that enthusiastic, and considering that the boys' health is her main concern, I couldn't understand her attitude. Regardless of how Karen felt, two days after the party, I took the boys for testing. These few days of waiting for the results were excruciating. When I got the results, my emotions were mixed. Please sit down, Mr. Turner. The doctor pointed to a chair. What's wrong with me? I asked, knowing that everything was clear with the boy. It seemed strange to us that after extensive tests, none of your sons showed any signs of hemochromatosis. Since we still had your samples, I asked the lab to do a DNA test. I hope you don't mind. I saw your concern at our last meeting. I looked at the doctor, knowing that the news would be bad. I'm afraid the tests have shown that you are not the biological father of your sons. I jumped up, claiming that the test results were incorrect. The doctor allowed me to rant for a few minutes before I calmed down and sat down again. Do all boys have the same father? I asked. Yes. Tests have confirmed that the father of all three boys is the same man. Since you didn't know about your condition, I assume your wife didn't know either? My wife didn't know. She still doesn't know the whole story. I told her about my health problems, but at the time I didn't mention that I was infertile. I clung to the hope that the boys would be mine. I'm sorry, Mr. Turner. I nodded. Could you give me a printed copy of the DNA results? I have a feeling that I will need them very soon. I thanked the doctor and left. Normally I would have thought about going home, but today I decided to go back to the office. As soon as I entered there, Don realized that something was wrong and followed me into my office, closing the door. What's the matter, Roger? You look like death. I have bad news, Don. I sat down and explained everything to Don. Jesus Christ, Roger. And what are you going to do about it? Don asked. As I see it, I have two options. I can say nothing and keep playing dumb, ignorant husband, or I can talk openly with Karen. The latter will probably lead to a divorce, I replied. 20 years. I've been living a lie for 20 fucking years. All this time I thought the boys were mine. Calm down, Roger. I'm sure there's an explanation for this. Oh, and I'm sure there is, Don. Maybe Karen will explain it to me tonight. I'm leaving you in charge for a few days. I need to sort out this mess. I'm sorry, Roger. Take as much as you need. If there's something I can't handle, I'll get in touch with you. Don returned to his office, and I sat and thought about how to sort out this mess. I mentally calculated that if we divorced, Karen would receive about two million pounds. Considering that I'm worth ten times more, I can afford it. I called my lawyer to consult, and since he mostly works with corporate clients, he recommended Arthur Crenshaw. Arthur Crenshaw is an old-school lawyer and knows a lot about the legal system. I told him about the prenuptial agreement we had made. Are you sure this is what you want to do, Mr. Turner? Yes. My wife can't tell me anything to fix the situation. Can I pick up the papers when they are ready? Of course. I'm in court tomorrow, and my secretary, Marion, will bring them to you. I thanked Arthur and left. I drove around the neighborhood until it was time to go home. When I entered the house, the twins were watching TV, and Karen was cooking dinner. Where's Robert? I asked. Stayed with friends for the night. The four of us are having dinner tonight, Karen replied with a smile. I was wondering if she would smile after our little chat. After dinner, the twins went to their rooms. After loading the dishwasher, I joined Karen in the living room. I had an interesting conversation with the doctor yesterday. Really? About what? Karen replied calmly. It was about the fact that the boys have no signs of a hereditary disease, which I have. After all the tests, nothing was found there, which is apparently very unusual. But the mystery was solved when the doctor performed a DNA test. The boy's DNA does not match mine, I thought. Could you explain this? For a minute, Karen sat in silence and looked at me. There's nothing much to say. The boys are not yours. Soon after our wedding, I fell in love with another man. My love was so strong that I wanted children from him. When we were trying to have a baby, I used a diaphragm until I made love to him, Karen replied almost without emotion. If you fell in love with someone else, why didn't you divorce me and start playing happy family with him? Because he was already married and had children. Now that we know you're infertile, it seems like I made the right decision. If it wasn't for that, 
we would never have become parents. I can't believe my ears. You got pregnant by another man because you fell in love with him. This means that we have been living a lie for 20 years. I still love you, Roger. I just loved another man more. That's clear. Otherwise, I wouldn't have given birth to his children. I'm going away for a while. I can't be around you right now. I'm going to sleep in the spare room tonight. I broke out and ran out of the house. After a few drinks in the pub, I returned home. Karen was sitting and watching TV. I ignored her and went to the spare room. When she knocked on the door about half an hour later, I pretended to be asleep. In the morning I took a shower, got dressed and left the house without saying a word. After a while, Karen sent me a text message. Are you okay? What do you think? I replied. Karen didn't say anything. I met with Dawn, then spent the morning looking for a house to buy. Later that day, I picked up the divorce papers. When I drove up to the house, Karen was alone. She smiled when I entered the house. And where are the boys? I asked sharply. Robert is walking again, and the twins are with my parents. Since we need to talk, I thought it would be better if the boys weren't here. I'm glad you assumed I'd be coming home. I'm not sure what you think we should be talking about. I'm going to get up and change, and while I'm changing, you can take a look at this. I threw an envelope on the kitchen table and left. When I returned to the kitchen, Karen was standing with her arms folded and a defiant expression on her face. Really, Roger? A divorce? Yes, Karen, the divorce. Last night you said you loved another man more than me. You loved him so much that you even had fucking children with him. But I still love you, Roger. A yes, of course, but not enough to have children with me. The fact that I am infertile does not change anything. If we had known then, we could have adopted someone. You went and got pregnant by that bastard without giving me the right to vote. As far as I know, you're still making love to him. Divorce is the only way out for me, Karen. As you can see, I am fair. You will receive two million pounds according to the prenuptial agreement. When I mentioned that Karen was still making love to him, she looked at the floor, and that told me everything I wanted to know. This is my house, Karen, so you're going to have to move out. Find a place for yourself, and I'll pay for it. We can deduct it from your two million pounds. In the meantime, I'm staying at the hotel. And what about alimony? Karen practically screamed. Since Robert is over 18, it doesn't matter. If you need alimony for the twins, ask their father, whoever he is. You're making a big mistake, Roger. You are the father of the boys, so you have to pay for them. I made a mistake marrying you, Karen. Just out of interest, who is the boy's father? I won't tell you. It won't change anything anyway. You're going to get a divorce anyway. I went back upstairs to pack my clothes. I was going to stay at a hotel for a few nights until I sorted something out. Karen was sitting at the table, crying as I carried the suitcases downstairs. I'll be back for my things in a day or two. There's enough for me here for a few days, I exclaimed, without waiting for an answer. I found myself an apartment that I could rent for two months, hoping that this would be enough for me. It also gave Karen a chance to find a place to live. Karen called me several times asking me to change my mind, but after the last call, which was very stressful, she gave up. My lawyer said she signed and returned the divorce papers. I gave her a month to vacate the house. Robert called to say that he was unhappy with his mother and asked if he could move in with me when I found a place for myself, and I said that his mother would move out of the house. When I called to talk to Ethan and Luke, they told me they didn't want to talk to me. I could hear Luke screaming that he hated me. Robert and I were talking one evening when Karen called him. He turned on the speakerphone. Yes. What do you need? Robert asked sharply. Robert, don't talk to me like that. I'm your mother. Show some respect. Respect? This is ridiculous. Robert stopped and stared at the phone. It's your own fault. You ruined this family. I don't want to have anything to do with you or that donor you call my father. Stay away from me and don't call me again. You are nothing more than an evil witch. Robert pressed the button to end the call. You should try to maintain some kind of relationship with your mother, I advised. She can go to hell, Dad. I don't want anything to do with her. Hopefully, when the twins get old enough, they'll realize how evil she is and leave. Karen found a home for herself and the twins, setting aside a room for Robert, even though he wasn't going to use it. I was at the house the day she moved out. Take a bed with you, Karen. I'll buy a new one. We've never done anything in the house. I don't believe a word you're saying, so take it. 
The whole time we were in the house, the twins ignored me and didn't look back when Karen left. Thanks to my wealth and the status of an ordinary child who achieved good results, the newspapers followed the story of the divorce. Public opinion was on my side. Most believed that Karen had treated me badly. Five months later, the divorce became final. Unfortunately, I had to pay alimony for the twins. Roger, this is Arthur. I'm just calling to inform you that you are a single man. Today the divorce has become final. Thank you, Arthur. I have a few questions for you. Can I challenge the alimony claim, and can I get my name removed from the boys' birth certificates? You can appeal the alimony claim, although it may take quite a long time. A paternity test will have to be passed by a real father before something happens, and he will probably try to avoid it at all costs. There is another way. It will cost a little more, but the result will be achieved faster. And what is it? I asked. You can sue your ex-wife for declaring you a parent by deception. This will mean that you will be deleted from your birth certificates and you will be able to claim back all the alimony that you paid after the divorce. If I subpoena her, I'll ask her to tell me her father's name. She won't be able to refuse to answer while under oath. This way, you can sue him for overdue alimony. Come on, Arthur. Prepare the papers and submit them. Please. I'll do it, Roger. I'll let you know when Karen gets them. Three days later, I was informed that Karen had been handed documents on parental rights fraud. I was expecting a call from Karen, and her silence bothered me a little, but Arthur called me and said that Karen's lawyer wanted to make an appointment. I told him to tell them that I was not interested and that we would see each other in court. On the day of the hearing, I sat with Arthur. Karen sat with her lawyer. She had a worried expression on her face. I assumed her lawyer was someone from the law firm that hired her. The hearing began with me explaining why I was suing Karen. Karen's lawyer asked me questions, as well as Arthur. After lunch, Karen was cross-examined by lawyers. Her lawyer was softer with her. Arthur was not so lenient. Ms. Matthews, your ex-husband is suing you for parental rights fraud. At a recent divorce hearing, you admitted that my client is not the father of your three sons. My client wants his name removed from the birth certificates and replaced with the name of his biological father. Could you tell us who the real father is? Karen sat in silence, staring at the floor. I can't. It will ruin his family and his life, Karen replied. Just like you ruined mine, I thought to myself. The judge's voice brought me back to reality. Miss Matthews, may I remind you that you are under oath? Please answer the question. Karen sat and stared straight ahead. She answered in a low voice, almost a whisper. Speak up, Miss Matthews, the judge said to Karen. Lawrence Rosenthal, Karen replied, and then stared at the floor again. The young woman behind me got up and left the court, and Arthur turned to the judge. Your Honor, Ms. Matthews gave the name of the biological father of her children. All my client wants is to remove his name from the birth certificates. Arthur came back and sat down next to me. The judge looked down at some papers. AI decided that Miss Matthews deceived her ex-husband into believing that he was the father of three children, although this is clearly not the case. Miss Matthews, I sentence you to six months in prison, suspended for two years. If you are on trial for any offense, these six months will lead to any sentence. Do you understand? Karen answered in the affirmative. Turning to me, the judge said, Mr. Turner, by court order, your name will be removed from the birth certificates of Miss Matthews' children. Since it has been proven that you are not the father, I release you from all financial obligations regarding alimony. Thank you, Your Honor, I replied. We stood up as the judge was leaving the courtroom. Arthur gathered up his papers, and we left the court. Karen came up to us in the foyer. I hope you're satisfied, Roger. You've probably ruined a man's life, not to mention ruined his marriage. With your wealth, you could afford to pay child support for a few more years. If you'll excuse me, I need to talk to Larry and tell him what happened. I hope to never see you again, and I won't talk to you from now on, Roger. Then Arthur spoke up. Ms. Matthews, I don't know what you're going to tell Mr. Rosenthal. I think it's fair to warn you that ten minutes ago he was handed the documents for the payment of alimony. Good day. Arthur and I left, leaving Karen crying. How did you manage to hand over the documents to Rosenthal so quickly? I asked Arthur. The papers had already been prepared by Marion. We only needed his name. When Karen told me who it was, my assistant came out of court to call Marion. 
She printed out the papers and handed them to the awaiting bailiff. Mr. Rosenthal was served before the hearing was over, Arthur smiled. The attorney said that after opening the envelope, Rosenthal fainted. When Karen entered the office, he was being taken away in an ambulance. As in the case of my divorce, all the paperwork went into the case. When newspapers appeared in stores the next day, Larry Rosenthal became a celebrity. It was through the media that I found out what happened. When the senior partners found out what caused Rosenthal to faint, they compounded his troubles by firing him. His relationship with Karen was contrary to company policy. Karen was also fired. My case against Rosenthal failed, and his wife acquitted him in a messy divorce. The court recorded in his personal file that he owed me 450,000 pounds, but I did not expect to see even a penny of them. Money wasn't a problem for me. I just wanted to ruin his life like he ruined mine. True to her word, Karen hasn't spoken to me since that day in court. Larry, when his wife kicked him out, moved in with Karen and, as far as I know, they are still together. Robert lives with me. He still refuses to acknowledge his mother and biological father. Now I divide my time between business and my friends. I have several friends with privileges, but I don't have a serious relationship with any of them since I don't intend to get married again. Twenty years of living a lie has been more than enough for me.